everybody. Thank you, Chad. Oh, it's short. My height. Sad. Um, how are you guys doing? Thank you for coming back after lunch and not going to nap somewhere in this church. That's where I would like to be right now. Just kidding. Um, I know it's a dreary day out there. Um, not the best for our hair, right, girls? Um, what can we do? I mean, we're trying to look our best for Campus Harvest. What's happening? Um, we're in Florida, P.S. Whatever. Um, but you know what? I am believing God that he wants to light a fire in us today. So let's not be tired, okay? Look to the person to your right and say, wake up. Wake up. Look alive. Okay, simmer down, simmer down. That's enough. Y'all are like, ooh, let's talk. You look really cute. I'm super happy to be here talking to you guys, representing the girls up here. (laughs) I know, I I love it. I love that I can just say the girls and y'all are like, yeah, it's a girl up there. It's like an automatic win. I'm happy to be up here. I love, love speaking to college students. You all are my favorite. Don't tell everybody else. But college students are my fave. Um, I love that I married a man that was passionate about reaching the college campuses, Aaron Austin. He's like my hero. Um, And he is so passionate about college students. And I'm so thankful to Jesus that I got to marry him and go on this adventure with him. And I'm thankful that I get to speak in front of you all today. Um, I don't know if I'm thankful about going after Adam and Adrian, though. I don't know about that. That's a little overwhelming. Let's not talk. Let's not even think about that. Let's not go there. They were, they were amazing. Uh, how about that? Are they not amazing? You all are so lucky. Um, I just want to jump right in, okay? Can we just jump right in? I want to, in these brief moments we have together, the clock is, they're looming before me. Um, I just want to give you three good reasons. Everyone say three good reasons. Three good reasons for you to not wait another day, another minute, to change your campus. Three good reasons to change your campus. I went to Lipscomb University, weird name, I know. Lipscomb, who would name a university that? Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. Woo, 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 anybody? anybody? Okay, good. Um, I went there, I went to school there, I transferred in from um, a college in Los Angeles, California, where I grew up. My brother was already there on a tennis scholarship. He played tennis for Lipscomb, and we were both there, and we wanted to change our campus for God, and we loved making disciples, winning people to Jesus. We loved a college life. Um, And one day, my brother came up to me, this is while I was in college, and he goes, Rach, he goes, the the number one girl on the tennis team, her name is Emily. She's new. She's a freshman. I just met her. She has a lot of questions about God. Can you talk to her? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll talk to her. And so um, I remember the day we met. We met on campus, and um, she was like, I just, I, I, my, your brother told me I had to meet you. And I was like, oh, gosh, what did he tell you about me? Um, that I pestered him growing up, like, constantly, every day of my life, and him, me? Um, hopefully not. Um, but we sat down and talked, and we ended up um, meeting every week and talking about Jesus and talking about her life. And she would always say, you know, man, I wish the team could hear this. I wish the tennis team could hear this, Rach. And I'd be like, yeah, well, let's pray. Let's start praying for your team. You know, thinking, you pray for your team. You go reach them. So one day, we were, me and my brother were hitting tennis balls on the tennis courts at Lipscomb. And um, I think it was my, maybe my junior year. And his coach walks out. And he's like, hey, John. He's like, hey, coach. You know, and so we're, we're, we're just out there, you know, playing tennis. And he's talking to my brother about some things. And he goes, it's your sister, Rachel, right? And I was like, hey, <laughs> you know, just doing my little thing out there. And uh, he's like, yeah, she's an awesome tennis player. Totally, my brother, uh, exaggerating. And I was like, no, 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 not at all. And, um, and he goes, hit, hit a couple of them for me. And I was like, oh, geez, oh, my gosh, what is he asking of me? Doesn't he know I write the fashion column for the school newspaper? My latest was trendy, trashy, or just plain tacky. I mean, not me. You know, I mean, girls, somebody's got to say it, though. Um, so we're, uh, so I'm out there and we're just, we're, you know, hitting balls and, um, <laughs> y'all, you ever have one of those moments in your life, the clouds part and the heavens open 
And it's like the light of God's face shone upon my tennis racket. And I was Anna Kornikova. I am not even kidding you. It was like I transformed into this pro athlete. And I was like, bam, bam. Just, I mean, my, my brother was like, whoa. Rach? What just happened? Um, and, so, and I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And the coach goes, here, serve one. And y'all, serving, not my cup of tea. Like, I was no good. So I, here I go. I get, I, you know, bounce it a couple times. Throw it up. Wham! I ace my brother. I ace the number three guy on the Lipscomb tennis team in front of the coach. The coach goes, um, hey, Rach, uh, can you get on the team? I was like, um, sorry, what was that? Do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> like, I mean, I think you wear cute outfits, like the tennis skirts, that's cool. But I'm not, like, never thought I'd be a pro athlete. <laughs> and my brother's like, whoa, yeah, Rach, do it. And, um, so the next day, I'm a D1 athlete at Lipscomb University. <laughs> Wasn't sure how I felt about that since I'd never stepped foot in a gym before. Um, and it was workout time. <laughs> I don't know if you know this. I didn't. But when you work out with, like, a, with college athletes, it's supposed to hurt. I did not know that. And they were like, you got to do squats. I'm like, you got to show me how. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> they were like, aren't you on the team? I was like, I guess. So, and I literally said out loud, this hurts. I don't want to do this. And he was like, yeah, well, life hurts. Suck it up. Um, Y'all, I won one match. I won one little match. But let me tell you what happened. I became the counselor, the psychiatrist, the therapist, the fight breaker upper. There are more emotions swirling around on a bus when you are traveling to one campus to another to play other teams in sports with a bunch of girls who are super emotional, P.S. So I was the girl, coach, I remember I'd be sitting there and I was filling in for the number six player so they could actually play matches. The number six player came back, so I was number seven, so I, I rarely played. But the coach called me the chaplain. So basically what I was there for, <laughs> you can imagine. So he'd be like, like he'd be over here talking to me like, hey, Rach. And I'd be like, yeah, coach. And I'd look out there. And there'd be a girl breaking down, or number two girl breaking down. Got it. You know, hey, you got this. Come on. You know. I was the girl who would bandage up the girl. The number two player would punch the mirrors at other, and on other, at Campbell. She punched the mirror because she was so mad she lost. And the mirror was, I was like sweeping it up, you know. Um, my dream was not to be a pro tennis player. That's not why I was on. Emily, the girl that I started meeting with, got radically saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit. The girls started watching me read my Bible every day. I started talking to these girls about their lives. I was with them all the time. You're with athletes. Gosh, you athletes in here, you're with each other all the time. Crazy. You have such a role to play, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I was with them all the time. They were asking me things all the time. Emily, we started going through the purple book. I started discipling her younger sister over the phone. Her younger sister gets saved, gets filled with the Holy Spirit. Her younger sister ended up coming to Lipscomb after Emily graduated, and she was the next number one player on the team. And she made disciples on the team. I won one match, but I won countless souls to the kingdom of God. And I'm not saying that about myself. Listen to me now. I'm not saying that about myself. What I am trying to tell you is now is the time to do something big with your life. Now is the time to do something big. Number one, you're in no better, there's no better time. There's no better time for you to do something big with your life. There's no better time. It's now. Now is the time to take a risk. I did, again, I did not see myself as being, you know, uh, having a tennis career. But you know what I was? I wasn't the superstar tennis player. How did I make it on that team? I think it was about God. I think God wanted to win souls. God isn't as interested in you being the superstar. He's interested in people who are willing because he's after people. He's after souls. And there is no better time for you to change your campus than now. 
If you will say yes to God, if you will take a risk, if you will think big, if you'll do something crazy, because you know why? Is as you get older, it's, there's more at stake. You're gonna, have, you're gonna be on a career path. You're gonna have you know, a husband and children one day. All of you all are gonna have those things, and it gets hard, it's just harder. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's harder to take risks and to, and to do big things and to try things out. And you all are in college. Now's the time to do something huge and big, something that no one else is doing. And go, I'm going to do it because I'm going to believe that God is who he says he is. And I'm not going to live for myself. I may not be the superstar tennis player, but you know what? If God opens the door, I'm going to walk. That might be what God is doing. And God is after people, and God wants to use you. There's no better time than right now. There's no better time. There's no better place, number two. There's no better place. You have such a, an amazing place right now in your life. You are, your proximity to the world is incredible. You sit in classrooms day in and day out with people from all over the world in them, every day, every day. And you are actually encouraged to sit in little group studies and talk about your beliefs and your opinions to discuss theories and philosophies, to give speeches. I remember at my major was public speaking, and I was like, yeah, I'll preach the gospel anytime you want. Like, give me a, you know, if it's informative, I'll preach on abstinence, or I'm sorry, speak. <laughs> Don't go preach. I'll speak on abstinence. I'll speak on something, but put me in front of people. But you all have such an opportunity, and you, you will not have this opportunity again to every day have the proximity that you have to the world. You all could change nations sitting in your classroom if, you will, if, if what comes out of you is from the Lord. The other thing is, you know, people come to college ready to find themselves. You're in an amazing place, college. People come on, on that campus as freshmen and they go, who am I going to be? What am I going to believe? What, who am I? I'm going to find myself. But who's going who's gonna to be my friend? Where am I going to belong? Those are the kind of questions people come into, into college with. You know, enter us. I'll tell you what I believe. I'll tell you where I belong in the spiritual family. I'll show you a place to belong. It's an amazing, it's an amazing place to be in your life on the college campus because people are all trying to find themselves. I remember my second um, I moved here to be in full-time campus ministry, and my, my second week in, in campus ministry, I was at JU. Anybody at JU in here? I was at JU for move-ins, and um, I hadn't been in campus ministry long, and I was, I was sitting on the step. I'm not going to sit down. I was sitting on the steps in front of one of the dorms, and um, I, was, I was literally, I was like, God, God, Lord, just help me to meet somebody. Help me to make a connection. Plop. Hi, my name is Lauren. What's your name? I'm serious. This happened. And I went, hi, I'm Rachel. And I met this girl. She sat down right next to me. Her name was Lauren Faulkner at the time. And um, she's a little cute sorority girl. And I was like, oh, that was easy. You know, <laughs> could it be any, any easier than that? They sit down right next to me and they introduce themselves to you. I was like, hi. Um, a week later, she got radically saved. A week later, filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, she was one of the first, she was the first person on staff with me and my husband when we first went into, became, I'm sorry, became the campus pastors here. She's one of my best friends to this day. But you're in an amazing place. People are looking for someone to be their friend. They're looking for a place to belong. They're looking for their people. They're looking to find their purpose. And if you can find yours first, hopefully we're there. If not, if you can find who you are and what you've been called to do on that campus, you'll be a light for your campuses, for people who are going, I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am. I don't know whose I am. And you'll be like, oh, I can help you with that. But people are looking. They're looking. You're in an amazing place. There's so many people around you who are looking for someone to define them. And they're looking really for their father in heaven. One of my best friends now um, back then was not one of my best friends yet. Um, she's a real beautiful girl. Her name was also Lauren. And she went to my school, and my brother introduced me to her again because he had won her boyfriend to the Lord. And he was on fire for God, and he was dragging her along. 
to everything, dragging her along. And she didn't look too happy to be there. And it was one of those people that you don't know if you'll ever connect with. And, um, and I would just pray for her and pray for her because I knew her, but she seemed real shut down to me. And, um, and just, it was hard to get through. And one night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just felt led to pray for her. And so I started praying for her. And how many of you all know when God tells you to pray somebody, for somebody, you better start praying because God has something to do. And I was like, oh, shoot, I'm going to have to be obedient to this. God starts speaking to me about her, and I was like, oh, great, now I have to actually go talk to this girl and tell her these things. And, um, and I was like, okay, well, I better be obedient to the Lord. So next time I saw her, I, I, I said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? And she's like, sure. And real guarded. And I said, I just, I don't know why, but I was, I was praying for you the other night, and I felt like the Lord told me to tell you that this is your place and that this is your spiritual family, and God chose you. He didn't just choose your boyfriend, Matt. He chose you because he loves you, and he's chosen you to do something great here, and that you're going to be a world changer. And I just, I just spoke what I knew the Bible had to say over her. I just spoke things that I knew God said over her. And she broke down crying. She, we prayed for her right then and there, and we've been best friends since that day. Best friends since that day. She's in ministry now, her and her husband. And why, do I, why am I telling you those stories? Is you have such, uh, you're in such a wonderful place to be able to build with people and love people who are looking for a place to belong, who are looking, going, who's going to help me? Who's going to be my friend? Where do I belong? Where do I fit in? Who's going to help, help me in this walk with Jesus? They're looking to find themselves. And we know who to introduce them to, don't we? To find themselves. There's no better story, number three. There is no better story. There is no better story for you to tell than the story of redemption that God has already done in your life. You don't need anybody to coach you through it. You don't need to go to a seminar about it. Yes, you should. Be trained, be taught. But what I'm saying is this, there is already a testimony inside of you. There is already a story. If you have gone from darkness to light, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then there is a story inside of you that is powerful. There is a powerful story inside of you that the people on your campus need you to say. You already have the story that they need to hear. The Bible says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Jesus will take care of the rest. He did on the cross. But you have the power of your testimony. And it's the story that you need to speak. You know why? Because it's an echo of the story. Your story of redemption and hope and and, and the redeeming power of Jesus, how how he picked you up and put you on a path of righteousness, and put you on a path of hope and life. That is what your campus needs to hear, and you have that. And it is an echo of the big story, the gospel, the story of Jesus coming to this earth to save them and redeem them and take them out of their darkness into his marvelous light. And that is the story, is it not? The story, the story that will save them The story that they are hungering and thirsting for. I guarantee it. I went to, me and Aaron took a a team to Africa years ago. And I remember when we landed, I was overwhelmed with the beauty and the expanse. And just the, it was overwhelming to me. We, looking at, and we took a safari. And just the, it was the beauty and the, the views and everything. And then at the very same time, of being overwhelmed by the beauty of it, I was overwhelmed with the despair of it. Because at the very heart of the people, if you you looked from afar, you'd be like, oh, oh, it's amazing. But then when you got got down into the the life, and there was so much despair, so much fear, so much hopelessness. And sometimes I see the college campus, and I see everybody so excited to, to find themselves and to live life and to have this freedom. But deep down, there's despair. And there's fear, and there is insecurity and hopelessness, and this question, who am I? But your story is powerful. And if you will use your story to change your campus, 
you will not be let down because God is already going before you. Because God, God's already preparing the battlefield for you. And he's won. And he's, he's looking at your campus and going, it's open, it's open. You got this. I can beat these things on your campus that you think are so strong and mighty. I can win. I will win. Will you fight with me? Will you change your campus now? God has set you up for winning on your campus. There's no better time in your life to reach people on your campus. There's no better place than the place that you're at right now, surrounded by people your age that you have common ground with, that are ready to hear there's no better story. They're ready to hear your story of what God has done in your life that echoes the big story, the gospel, who Jesus is. God has set us up. He set you up. Because he wants to reconcile his children back to himself. His children are on your campuses. His sons and daughters who are in despair and hopelessness, they're on your campuses. And he's looking Again, not for the superstar, but he's looking for someone who's willing to tell their story, to tell the story. So now we know why we should go. There's no better time, place, or story. But what will enable us to personally do this, to really go change our campus? Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Adrian referred to this scripture earlier today, Matthew 16. In the message, it says, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to finding yourself, your true self. In this passage, deny yourself doesn't mean to act like you're not important. It doesn't mean to devalue yourself. What it means is to put the interests of the kingdom first and foremost in your life. That's what this scripture is talking about. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm so unworthy. Deny myself. Just don't think about myself. It means whatever the kingdom of God is about, that's what I'm about. I will put the interests of the kingdom of God first and foremost in my life. While I'm on this campus, the interests of the kingdom of God will be what reigns in my mind. When I step into my classroom, I will go, what is he interested in in here? What is God about in here? What is he after? When I'm in my dorm, I'll say, what is God after here? What is he going after? What is he fighting for? I'm going to fight for that. The interests of the kingdom of God will be my interests. We have to put them first in our lives. So what is he after? What is God after? When he says, follow me, I'll show you how. Where is he going? What is he after? What did he come here to do? What did Jesus come here to do? In Luke 4, 18, this is what Jesus says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is, what he, this is where he is going, remember? If we're coming with him, you need to think about this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed and pr to proclaim the favorable year of our Lord. His mission becomes our mission. If you will step onto your campus and believe God that he has called you to reach your classmates, your roommates, his mission, if you will take on his mission and say, I'm with you, where you go, where you're going, I'm with you. When Jesus says, come with me, whoever is with me, this is the game plan, this is the strategy. We're going to preach to the poor. We're going to see the blind see. We're going to see the oppressed walking in freedom. That's what God has for you. That's what he's promised you for your campuses. His mission on this earth becomes our mission now. And we go, Jesus, I'm with you. And where you go, where you lead, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna follow you and I'm gonna see, I will see my campus changed for your glory. Later on in this verse, it says, do not be in such a hurry to go into business for yourself. And we have to disagree 
with the enemy of our souls. We have, to, we have to disagree with the world that says, you've got to make a life for yourself. You have to use your time to build your life. To, you know, it's all, it, you better watch out for yourself because no one else will. I don't want to live that way. In this verse, it, sa- it says self-help is no, self at all. Sel- is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way to finding yourself, your true self. And you might say, well, what about me then? What about me? I thought I was in college to advance my giftings, my careers. Of, absolutely. I'm not saying to be the best. I'm not saying to, make, to not make straight A's. I'm not saying not to do well. I'm saying what's first has to be the kingdom of God. And you know what? I believe if you will give and pour your life into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God will pour into your life. A lot of you girls, you're looking for f- good friendships. You're like, who's going to be my best friend? Who, who are my friends going to be? Where's my husband? Who's going to do that? Who's going to look around for that if I'm busy doing the kingdom work? Well, let me tell you something. I had 11 bridesmaids, I know, and three honorary bridesmaids. Seven of those were girls I either went to the Lord, discipled, or walked with in campus ministry. And eight of those altogether are now in ministry. I'm not saying that to toot my own horn. Understand what I'm saying. If you will reach people for the kingdom of God, just like those stories I told you, all three of those people were some of my best friends and continue to be, and I do life with them. We raise our kids together. We preach the gospel together. If you want to have great friendships, if you want a life that looks amazing, if you want the best marriage, the best friends, the best education, the best jobs, you pour into the kingdom of God, and you build people, and you be about what the interests of the kingdom are, and you go, that's what my life is going to look like. The interests of the kingdom will be first in my life, and those relationships are going to build my life. I have some of the, I I look at my life sometimes and I think, oh, my friends, I have the best friends. I couldn't ask for better friends. I look at my marriage and I think, oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you did this. Thank you that you showed me that I was supposed to reach people with my life. Thank you that I started doing that and I didn't just, you know, look for a husband first because I ran right into him because we were both on mission. We were both on mission. I promise you, if you will get on mission, if you will be about the kingdom business, that your life will, will be the life you could have never imagined. God will build your life as you build the kingdom of God. God will not withhold from you any good thing. He's a good father. We have to die to self-centered ambition that glorifies ourself. And you refuse to agree with the world that says live for yourself. And we have to take on God-centered ambition. Let me tell you what ambition means. The word ambition means an earnest desire for some type of achievement as power, honor, fame, and the willingness to strive for its attainment. God-centered ambition means someone whose goal is to make God famous. Someone who wants to see the power of God on their campuses Someone who wants to see God honored on their campuses. God-centered ambition is someone who will do whatever it takes, is willing to strive to see God-given glory on their campuses, to see God made famous on their campuses. And I don't know about you, but if God has set me up for victory already, I'm going to play my part. I'm going to take on his God mission, and I'm going to have God-centered ambition and say, I've been called for such a time as this. And my campus is open. Sometimes I think we pray over and over for our campuses to be open and really we should be praying for our eyes to be open because God has already opened our campuses there's no better time in your life to reach your campus there's no better place you're surrounded and there's no better story you have the story that they need to hear and the spirit of God is going to prepare the way for each one of you all to walk into your classrooms, to walk into your dorm rooms and bring something that hasn't been there before. The power of the living God, hope, peace, love. God is after your friends on campus with his relentless love. He is going before them because he loves them. 
and he wants them to be reconciled to him. And he's looking for someone who is willing to take on his mission. It's really easy. He's already prepared it for us. Your campuses are more open than you think. People are more open than you think. But who will go? Who will say, yes, I will, take a, I will take, do big things for God. I'll take a risk. Who will say, yes, I'm going to say no to self-centered ambition and say yes to God-centered ambition. I'm not going to live for myself. I'm going to live to make him great on my campus. And I will strive towards it. I will be willing to strive for his name on my campus. I want to pray for us as we close. I want to pray and ask God to put us on mission with him on our campuses and for our eyes to be opened because I believe God has already set you up, each one of you. I believe that God has set you up. God has people in mind. He has people in mind for you to reach and he has a story that he has inside of you and I want to pray that just like the song we sang, that God would make us brave that God would make us brave, that we would be brave, willing young people on a campus that's wide open, that it, on a campus that's full, where the harvest is ready, that we would walk into our campuses and say, and say this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to those who are blind, to set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord on my campus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the story that's in every single one of these young people in this room. Thank you that they already have the story to tell, the story of redemption and hope, the story of you taking their lives. Their lives that may have been a mess, that, that, where they were in darkness, and now bringing them into your marvelous light. God, I thank you that you've given us a story to tell. I thank you, God, for the gospel and the power of the gospel to save those that are perishing, God. God, I thank you, Lord, that you have made a way even now on our campuses. You have made a path for us to take on our campuses, to walk and to be restorers and redeemers and rescuers on our campus, to bring the Redeemer to our campus. God, I pray that we would have God-centered ambition, that we would have eyes that see you, Jesus, and see what you are about on our campuses. God, show us the interests of the kingdom in our classrooms, in our dorm rooms, all over our campuses. And God, I pray that we would be on mission with you that we would be those that see our friends, our teammates, and our classmates walk in freedom because we were on mission with our God and King. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all.